Welcome to episode 19 of the Strategic Momentum Podcast. I'm your host, Connie Steele. Can you think of one or two managers that were influential to your career success? Maybe you were lucky to have four or five. In today's episode, our guest, Beth Friedman, tells her story on how the support and mentorship she received from bosses early on in her career inspires her to now pay it forward to the people she now leads. As a managing director of Gyro UK, an award-winning global B2B marketing agency, she's striving to create that work culture that prioritizes the human part of a service-oriented business. Beth also shares her philosophies on management and helps create momentum for her organization inside and out. Thanks, Beth, for joining us today. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Connie. I've uh, really enjoyed listening to the podcast since you started it, and it's uh, pretty cool to be a part of it. Well, thank you so much. I mean, you I know that you've been in the agency business for all of your career, but you've held you know various roles throughout that time. Currently, you are the managing director of Gyro UK, this leading global B2B creative agency. It'd be great for you to share you know, your background and, and your career journey and what really led you to where you are today. Well, to be honest, it started because I really just wanted to be employed when I graduated from college. Uh, and and I was coming out of uh, the University of Virginia without any particularly applicable work experience in any of the main industries that seemed to want to recruit on that campus. Uh, and during the time that I was writing my thesis, the only thing I was doing besides trying to finish it in time to hand it in was using the sort of nascent internet to go on to Yahoo Jobs and see what kind of opportunities there might be. I looked sort of down the East Coast from Boston to New York to DC, happened to see a listing one day for an assistant media planner role. I faxed my resume. Uh, so that says something about how old I am. And, <laughs> and they were kind enough to say, we'd love to meet you. But of course, for an entry-level assistant media planner job, we will not be flying you to New York. So drove up to New York with my father had the interview, got offered the job, and thus began my extremely lucrative $19,000 a year job in media planning in New York City. (laughs) Um, But that is honestly how it it happened. I was surprised more than anyone that that job involved a pretty good amount of math because I was too busy looking at this amazing agency set up where you walk in and there's a life-size Tonka truck and a half-court basketball court because they'd worked with the Nets and they were Hasbro's, one of Hasbro's main agencies. And you just come in, you go, this is is amazing. I want to work in this environment. And and the truth is, it was everything I thought it would be in regards to that. It was interesting and energetic and fun. But I think what kept me in it, besides getting over the fact that it wasn't just all math and actually just sort of a basic set of skills uh, (laughs) for that part of the job, were two things. One was the job itself was really interesting. Media planning, which is what it was called then, was all about sociology. It was just about human behavior. It's about figuring out who behaves how and where, and then telling your partners who create the ads where to put them so that they get it to the people at the right time. I mean, it's as simple as that. And I think the other reason I stayed in it uh, was that I just continued to have a succession of incredibly good bosses from my very first boss who was, you know, you wouldn't ever pick her out of a crowd and think this is going to be someone who's going to have such a massive impact on your your career in terms of just being one of the best managers I've ever had. Uh, she, one of my first assignments, she asked me to write a point of view document on a particular magazine for a particular Hasbro brand we were working on. And I proudly marched into her office with a single page, double-sided, single uh, spaced you know, thesis basically on on my recommendation and point of view. And she looked at it and would have very rightly been able to say, are you kidding me? And instead looked at it, read it, said that this is great. Now, do you think maybe you could come back with like a two paragraph version? And as simple a lesson as that was, she could have taken... There wasn't probably enough red ink in New York City for what needed to be cut out of that. (laughs) But she could have done that. She could have absolutely t- done that. She could have tried to write it in her own style. She just said, this is terrific. You've, you know, It's great information. Can you just try to make it more concise? And so what she gave me was an assignment as an evolution on an assignment instead of uh, making me embarrassed that I you know, clearly way overdone it. 
And, you know, that, those things, that, that's always stuck with me. Um, and that was one of many really amazing, you know, lessons that even as I was 22 years old, I was getting taught by this, this great woman. And, and it just sort of evolved from there. I, you know, moved to another agency and again, was incredibly lucky to work for, you know, a couple of really great bosses within that organization. Um, I had some of the most career defining moments or, and I mean, even to this day, as a part of that second agency, because it was an, an environment that was very much about meritocracy. If you you worked hard and and you you delivered and you were you know, high performing, you were recognized. And when I look at back, I, I think that's the thing I, I wish we had more of today, or were more empowered to do today. Because back then, it felt really real that you know whether it was a pay raise or a promotion or just the opportunity to do something that you wouldn't necessarily expect at a you know at your level you'd be allowed to do those were coming my way. And that was because I worked for people who always saw success in my success and never saw it as anything other than that, no threat to theirs. And I was, you know, lucky enough not to realize how lucky I was, uh, you know, at that point in my career, because I'd had no bad experiences in regards to any different type of behavior. And then I know you switched from media planning to the account side, which is very different. Uh, so tell us a bit about that. And then ultimately how you ended up being you know, the managing director of you know, an entire agency. Well, it, you know, one of those career defining moments that I mentioned at the second agency I was at was at a moment where the chairman of the agency, who was someone who was so much like more senior than I was at the time at the role, I was at a supervisor level, but uh, he you know, kind of plucked me out of a meeting one day and said, I think you can handle this and you know, kind of put me in a, a new business pitch. As this, you know, and I was by far the least senior person in that room. My title was an embarrassment compared to the people in that room trying to keep the business. But he just and he says, you know, from watching you in one meeting, you can do this. And I, I probably only recently started to forget what I actually said in that meeting because that's how much it left an imprint on me because I was so... It was so cool. And he at the time said, I think you should go into account management. I was still in media. And I, I said, why? And he said, because account people run agencies. And I said, well, media people run media departments. And I really like what I do. And he said, that's fine. You know, just come back to me in a couple of years when you realize that you know, you're ready to make a change. Now, it wasn't a couple of years. It's more like seven or eight. But it, it did happen. And, and it, I think back to that because... The reason I changed wasn't because he said that to me, but the reason it was always in the back of my mind was certainly from that conversation. I think there were more of a confluence of reasons for me switching when I did. Um, most important, you know, most frustrating was the devolution of media into these silos where all of a sudden media agencies were either traditional, which is everything else, and digital, so the internet. And back then it really was just the internet. It was already on the back of media being pulled out of creative agencies. So you'd gone from, I started in an agency, which was full service. We had media, we had creative, we had strategy. Uh, and then media got taken away and boutiqued so it could be charged as a separate you know, bottom line. And then they split it again and then it was digital and traditional. And all of those things weren't particularly conducive to what I, you know, I thought was great output as a total agency, but also equally, as you did, your job just got smaller and smaller or more siloed. It's, it's not, it didn't align with what I loved about the business, which is if it's about the people and the behavior. And in media, that's what it's about. And if you're asking me to tell you where to put your messaging and, and what the, the right medium is to do, but then you're only asking me to look at a quarter of the way I might talk to that person, it's your head doesn't work that way. You don't plan that way. You need to look at 360 degrees of everything. But that wasn't as profitable as switching, <laughs> you know, siloing into separate companies. And because of competing bottom lines, you now had a traditional and a digital agency both wanting to own that relationship or at least mirror that relationship. And it was the least client-centric thing you could do. Because a client doesn't need two senior most contacts. They need one who is ensure, will ensure that they bring the right people to the table for any conversation. So I was caught in the middle a lot with clients saying, why do you have to keep bringing someone else to the table? I'm happy to go through you. And it's, well, you know, I need you to make sure you have the right people. 
it was, you know, you, you were making excuses. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like things became less and less, you know, client centric, which is ideally where most businesses should focus is customer centric slash client centric. But it even seems like your role fundamentally changed from being also more customer centric because you couldn't have that, as you said, 360 degree view. So if your passion is about understanding you know, holistically the behavior of your customer and your job is not enabling you to do so, then I could see where there's that desire to, to shift so you can be fully focused on what's best for the customer ends up being what's best for the client. Yeah, and, and, and ends up being what's best for the, the, the person and all of that, which is the employee. And it, it was interesting because... You know, I, I was sort of having a crisis of faith of I'm not sure what I want to do. Maybe there's a place somewhere that still does it the way that, you know, I think it should be done or the way I'd like to do it, I think is a better way to say it. You know, but there was also one other part to this, which is within that organization that I was at, um, it was my absolute first experience of that the squeaky wheel gets the oil which is I had just never experienced before, which is that, you know, it's the absolute flip side of the meritocracy. So it was only the people who are complaining the loudest, only the people who are, you know, just, you know, in the ear of the right people are seeing movement in their career. And I, I still, to this day, feel as though if it's not recognized by the people I work for, then it's not deserved yet. Even in an environment at that point where I knew that, it, it, that's not how recognition was being doled out. It was simply like we were trying not to have to do that, and if if we have to, it'll just be for the ones that are you know being the loudest about it. Um, and I struggled with that mightily, and that was probably as big of any reason that I didn't want to continue, you know, following that path if I couldn't find a place that not only maybe was going to operate the way I wanted to, but that certainly operated among the principles that I had been. I was brought up that way. You just, you work hard, you deliver, you go above and beyond, you get recognized for it. That's how it works. So I think that confluence of events put me in that, you know, sort of mindset that it was time to make a change. And I happened to work with, at the time, my creative agency that I was working with, the chief creative officer and the president there both sat me down and, and suggested that maybe the move was into account management. And the way they pitched it to me was, you don't walk away from media in that regard because it's still a part of everything you oversee, but it's one part and it's more of a global view and a start to finish all the way through the journey with the client. You know, client service was not foreign to me because in media, you were also a client service person, but you had one responsibility. And it was really interesting to think about having to elevate up to thinking about the entirety of, of what we deliver in the communications agency side. Uh, it was also incredibly humbling and incredibly challenging because all of a sudden I went from being someone who had you know a decade of experience and was fairly comfortable with that I knew what I was talking about to sitting in creative reviews, being very clear that I wasn't sure if I had any sort of gut instinct for what was right or what wasn't uh, or strategic input to put into a brief. And I think it's a really good experience to have because it teaches you not to be afraid to admit what you don't know because you will be a bigger fool for it if you don't. And also, you know, it's a proof point that if you've got a fast learning curve and you're not afraid to ask questions, you can even catch up on the things you don't know and really start to, to, to evolve. So, you know, that, all of that kind of drove me there and then being very lucky to have two people who were willing to give me the chance to move over at a senior level and... And, uh, and, and, and take a chance. And they did. And, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful to them because it's because of that move that, you know, the rest of the moves that I've made between then and now have gotten me to where I am here today. So what's been really fascinating to listen to you, Beth, in this journey is that your upward mobility and, and really momentum seem to be predicated on Great bosses who focused on people, on the potential of people, identifying their talent, giving them that opportunity, but also knowing when to present it to them, knowing how to coach them effectively, uh, and, and you know, building their confidence to enable them to realize they do have that potential to achieve, to try something different, and to you know, to change, which can be extremely scary. So, how how does that 
experience for you, how has that parlayed into what you're doing today in your current role? Well, I think that just in general, because I can absolutely trace back so much of my development to various moments with various bosses who've just given me perspective or who have given me the right amount of support, who've given me the right push. You know, in this business or any business, I think you work with people that you learn from both in ways that you want to be like and in ways that you don't. And both are equally valuable. But I by far am the, you know, so lucky that I had so many more positive experiences. And I think just the fact that I, I wanted to pay it forward in the way that I became a manager. Someone said to me once, Beth, the biggest struggle anyone who is, is, a, is a good doer, who's a, a high achiever has is when they try to make that shift to managing because all of a sudden it's not about what you can do. It's about what you can get others to do. It's about how you can teach them. So it's like my first boss who didn't edit my piece, but actually gave me the guidance to get what she wanted from me in the end. Um, But it's that every day. And I see that in the people that I work with all the time, that it's such a struggle because the other side of it is you're used to the validation and recognition that being the all-star I really have learned to be careful about that overpraising of, oh, she's our young superstar, because it really sets you up for failure when you get to a point where that praise has to be directed to someone else and you're struggling to feel valid and, and, and realize that your success is as much about how this person who reports into you is performing. And, you know, so it was all sorts of those things that I, you know, learned along the way um, and tried to apply where I could. Um, and I've had a succession of positions in the, you know, sort of the most recent years where part of my job is not just about running a piece of client business, but it's also about running a department full of people. And then therefore, in theory, outside of that, making them better at their jobs. And even with the client business, you're running larger teams of people. And you know, there's another piece of advice that I was given once, which is about just understanding the value of everybody that works for you. And I think... The people who taught me knew this and obviously knew it intrinsically. And I'm just grateful for the one who put it into words for me, which is no matter how good you are, no client just pays for you. And Mm -hmm. you need that. You have to make them feel the value of every person they're paying for or eventually they will leave. And it's, it's humbling and it's awesome because all it really does is say, remember, you're the coach, not necessarily the star player. Sometimes you're on the field, but lots of times you're about putting the right team on the field. And, you know, and, and this job that I'm now at has really been the culmination of getting the opportunity to come into a business where we can not only focus um, outward about building the business, but where we have the resource to allow me to focus looking down and across the business to really build the people where so much of my remit is focused on the people here versus just simply going out and selling and running the client business and finding more revenue. And that for me was, that was a bit of the holy grail. It was the part of the business that I knew I was supposed to be doing, but was trying to do in all the, the sort of shoulder hours. And, and this was an opportunity to come in and, and really have that be you know as much, if not more important to what I'm doing uh, you know, on day-to-day client business. So let's talk more about service-based businesses, more specifically, just like agency businesses. And what sets great ones apart at the end of the day really are the people, as we talked about. Now, in agencies, and particularly as you know, your role in the past is, is the account lead and, and given your role now, your bench strength does really make all the difference in the world. So what do you feel are the typical challenges that, that people face when trying to build and develop that team? You know, I think that the biggest issue facing agencies these days is a little bit of the myth of human resources. Um, I kind of say this, and it's not fair because I have very many friends who work in human resources. But I think, unfortunately, we're we're being driven to an approach that's much more just resource and the human part's gotten lost. Uh, We have to run incredibly lean. That puts a lot of pressure on people. Uh, you know, at every level. But it also means that you are often not getting the time to really train your bench strengths, to train your junior people to be performing better and performing up. 
uh, you know, so that your senior people can work up and so that your most senior people aren't actually day-to-day client contacts. Now, I've been a part of small businesses, um, you know, for the last part of my career. And, um, and we will always go in and we will commit to senior leadership being a regular part of business. But there is a difference between being regularly available and being the day-to-day doer on a piece of business. And the truth is that's no good for anyone because I know how to do that. But there are people in my agency that need to learn how to do that so that they can have the same upward mobility that I was lucky enough to have because I had bosses who were able to train me and get out of my way, give me room so they could do other things. You know, I I said it before, but clients don't just pay for one person. And we are putting ourselves at risk every time we have one strong performer and a bunch of other people that the clients are like, yeah, you tell me they're good, but I don't really see or feel them. And equally, you just, it, it doesn't beget loyalty or staying power with the people that work for you. It, you know, there's, there's only a certain point where you feel as though you're being challenged or you have room to grow or that you're getting face time. You know, there's a lot of different ways that people, I think, feel recognized in an ad agency business. And, you know, we, if we are constantly running at such a sort of survival and lean mode that, it, you know, everybody just plays one tiny role and that's the only role they get to play. It just really limits the sense that anything will ever change. Um, and I just think that at the end of the day, if I'm going to say, I know for a fact that I am selling the resource of the humans that I employ. Like th- it, this is all an agency is, is the diversity of people and personalities and backgrounds and skill sets that comes together to create some magic thing that I then, you know, give to a client and say, see, aren't you glad you work with us? And if you don't have that wonderful, magical human mixture of insanity, you won't have very quality product. And, and so we cannot continue to sort of devalue the human part of the resource. And, and for me, that's such a big part of, of, of how I think we have to move forward in order to, to, to future-proof ourselves. Ironic, I know, in a world where we're talking about automation, but creativity lives in a, a strange little place where automation can't quite get to. Yet, anyway, I hope. Beth talks about the challenge of not prioritizing the people who are at the heart of these service-based businesses and are the ones who ultimately create the best end product. Rather, the focus has been on ensuring you have the bodies to get it done, particularly when you are constantly running in survival mode. However, that mode of operation becomes limiting to not just yourself, but everyone around you. And ultimately, if leaders can't elevate themselves, then they can't elevate their employees. Next, we ask Beth why barriers exist with respect to creating upward momentum for your employees. So Beth, let's cover another challenge that I'm I'm sure that you've faced in in managing your organization but one that ties back to something we talked about earlier where you know, you've been able to grow um, and have this upward momentum because people saw your ability and gave you those opportunities well what are those challenges that you see in in other organizations fostering that kind of mentality with with their leadership team well I think it's interesting right so there's a lot of people, especially in a younger generation, that immediately are like, who's my mentor? And, uh, you know, what are you going to do for me? And it's interesting because I heard someone say to me once, like, that um, mentorship shouldn't be something you just get. Um, it's something, in some sense, that you earn, that you have to create a relationship. I mean, it's a two way street. But I think actually, before that ever even happens, I learned so much by osmosis. I swear to you that for the majority of the first, I'd say, six years of my career, I spent more time sitting in my boss's office next to their desk, like either co-creating, co-writing, like just listening and learning in meetings, listening and learning. And one of the things that I think is sadly less apparent these days, and I don't think this is just with younger generation. I think it's just in general, people are so on a mission to show they can do something that they don't take time to just sit back and listen and learn. So I continue to learn like that. Um, and I don't know where that's changed for people or, you know, because I don't think it's unique, but I do think it's something that 
to me, I, I, it feels really important to let people know my expectation that they do that. That I want to know that if I'm in a room with them doing a presentation, that they're critiquing it in their minds and thinking, I'd like to do that that way, but boy, I wouldn't do it that way. And this is why. That they're not just you know, multitasking and writing emails because I'm taking the hard, you know, the, the heavy part or something. I think in terms of management and their openness to sort of creating their own bench strength, I find it really hard to understand why we wouldn't all actively want to be doing that because I think the majority of us sit in rooms wondering why we're not getting the chance to do the things that we thought we'd get to do with the job we have because we're busy doing things we did in the job we had before. I think the balance of giving people high expectations in regards to what we expect them to be able to do and able to learn by just being a part of the process. And then also then using mentorship and training and you know, just exposure to different things to plug the gaps or amplify bits that they wouldn't necessarily get exposed to. I think when you do it more holistically like that, I think it's certainly more satisfying, but it's a heck of a lot more self-motivated too. Let's talk about the benefits of being able to tap into the potential of your employee base and the challenge that your leadership or your manager team doesn't always think about that. And and where have you seen that happen in your career? And why do you feel that that inhibits this, um, honestly, upper mobility of your employee base? I think it's a couple of things that really create the challenge. I think that we all have to remember that um, you know when you get to a management level, you know these are people who've worked really, really hard to get where they are. Um, not everybody's had the same uh, path, or you know can look back with as much gratitude as I do as to how I got here. Because I'm certain I wouldn't have been able to do it without a whole lot of people and a whole lot of luck. And I think that that always will inform how someone manages. Uh, and that equally will then inform how they invest in the people who work for them. Uh, you know, the first negative experience I had in terms of just you know that sense of making room for people to be successful wasn't with someone who was a direct manager of mine, but with someone who actually saw me as a threat to their job, um, sort of more of a, a level colleague. Um, and there were a couple of things that informed that. There was quite an age disparity. I was much younger. And, and there was a sense of somehow I must not have worked as hard or had to deal with as much to get to where I was. You know, there, I think that that, you know, sense that somehow, you know, somebody else's path has been more primrose than yours can probably be quite uh, impactful on how you positively or negatively foster their development. I also think, God, I think it's really interesting. And I knew this was going to happen at some point in my career because I did have great upward mobility and I, I was promoted quickly. Um, and I was often the youngest in the room for a period of time. And I, you know, quietly in my own sort of heart was very proud of that, but always was really careful to kind of avoid that being a point of awareness for anyone because um, I knew there was going to be a moment in my career where I would no longer be the youngest in the room and that in fact people would expect that I'd be good at my job at the age I was. But I think that especially these days with the influx of super, super successful young people who are you know now in management positions, managing people who are significantly older than them, I can imagine the insecurity of, of those in management trying to figure out how to navigate and, and accept the success of much younger people when in fact, it was a lot harder or a lot different for them. So what do you think they need to do? So to, to navigate that touchy situation, so to speak? Well, I think, I think you have to have the perspective to realize um, what your success is predicated on. Because at the end of the day right now, I want to fill this place with the people who are going to drive this business the most successfully because that will make us the most successful. Therefore, I will have done a good job. And therefore, wherever I go next, I am on the back of an extremely successful run. I've always said that I'd rather do good work with great people than great work with assholes. And I just fundamentally think that it's late <laughs> to assume that you can only do good work with great people. I think you can find great people who are capable of great work and it's harder, but you do it. And I work in an industry where you know you got away with being a, a pretty big jerk uh, if you were super talented for a very long time. And I think you know there's a massive cultural shift these days and people are getting you know fired 
quickly over behavior that is unacceptable. It's not easy to answer uh, for everyone. It's not one way we can do it. But I do think the one thing that we can probably all come together on is the idea that it has to be earned. Um, and so it isn't just given. And, and it's just a question of where the balance is of what we do to enable you uh, as an employee, as a, a future prospect, and what you have to do in order to also enable yourself. And I think if you can create a culture where expectations are set high from both sides, so as management, we will commit to you, but as an employee, you have to commit to us in terms of, of the kind of performance and the kind of you know, learning you will do. I think if it feels more equal, if it feels more committed from both sides, it's probably an easier negotiation, even for those that are struggling a little bit, like finding their own success and giving other people those opportunities. At the end of the day, creating upward momentum for employees involves establishing an environment based on meritocracy, also supports career growth, and clearly communicates expectations. Yet it's also incumbent upon employees to realize that their learning can't all be through mentoring. They have to spend some time to listen and observe everything around them because some things are truly learned through osmosis. In many organizations these days, you're also dealing with a multi-generational workforce. So how do you manage that dynamic and create a culture that can work for everyone? Let's find out. The other dynamic that's interesting for agency businesses is the youth of you know the workforce. You've got obviously a very creative team, but you've got a lot of young people who typically work in the in the agency business. And so with the millennial generation, you know, you're you're dealing with those dynamics as well, and they have different expectations and work styles. So, how do you account for some of the challenges and dynamics and expectations that they have? Because they constantly want to be challenged. I know they constantly want to be moving up as well, and given those opportunities that you were given. Yeah, I, I think it's been really, really interesting because um, there is such a definitive schism uh, between sort of any generation and that generation, you know, so older generations than us, our generation, that generation. Apparently now there are centennials as well. But it's interesting. I think the the sort of rare situation here, and I think it's one of the most brilliant things that we have in our arsenal at at Gyro is that actually not only do I have, you know, the the general different, generational difference of, of the millennials and everyone else, but we do have quite a range of, of ages here and backgrounds and ethnicities. And so equally, as much as I've got to manage against the expectations of a younger generation who've been brought up in a very sort of different environment, I also have to manage the expectations of the older generations that we have here who's were equally maybe uh, coming at it with a slightly outdated view. Um, so perhaps a millennial looks at something and says has an unrealistic view. And perhaps someone who's a bit older looks at something and has a slightly unrealistic view as well. And so finding the, the, the middle ground on that is really important. And for me, the thing I always just say to people here is that I don't care if you're 22 or 52. I just want some grown-ups in my business. Honestly, you know, maturity is something that doesn't matter how old you are. Experience, different story, but maturity and work ethic are ageless. And what we have to do is just find the people across, no matter what age they are, that share those uh, similarities, who you know want to be a part of a strong culture. I think that's one of the things we have to our benefit as well, is that you know this is a place full of really good humans that know they can depend on each other and that they'll roll up their sleeves and, and be there to help. And you know this is a... We're very flat politically and hierarchically. So there isn't, you know, that it's a really, really nice culture. I'm very lucky that they thought enough of me to bring me into that. So we have all of these good things. But for me, you know, it is, it just comes down to you're a grown up. I'm going to give you the autonomy and the respect that you deserve as one. And if you can live up to that, great. And if you can't, you're probably not going to stay here very long. And so what else do you feel it takes to, one, create that right culture where you can give people that opportunity to grow and and create that meritocracy, so to speak, that that you grew up with, Um, but also a culture in which you have that type of diversity that can create the kind of magic 
that you've you've indicated because as you think about building the right composition of a team and for you a a, a agency a full blown you know group of fantastic people in this agency you know what else do you feel it really takes to make that happen as i will default to sports metaphors you know but it is because i i do cling to this one because it's you know there's two that really you know make sense to me one has always been that sense of being the coach of a team because most of your job is enablement um, and looking ahead and charting the plays. But the other bit of it is just, uh, and it's actually a, a, you know something that they say a lot at, at my previous agency at Saatchi, which is about playing in position. And I think that is one of the most phenomenally just relevant and true statements you can make about how any business will succeed. And certainly one like ours, where there's so many different expertises and so many different points of view. At the end of the day, it's really important that we all know how to play in position so that I know that even though I may feel responsible and may be responsible for the entirety of of a piece of business, I have to trust that my creative partner is going to be the end-all and be-all opinion on what work we put forward. Because when it comes to playing in position, I know the business, he's the guy running the creative. And it's not always as simple as that, but I think it just makes for a respectful workplace and, you know, an intelligently based respect. And that, I think, is a massive way to traverse the, the age diversity. Because if you're here, then you've earned a seat at the table and you have a position to play. And it doesn't matter how old you are. And, you know, the interesting thing is that it's coming in with, this is what you bring to the table. And so maintaining a group of people who are open-minded about that. And that actually was a lesson I learned from an old creative partner of mine who, you know, just really said, if these people are in the room, they have a right to an opinion. And at the end of the day, it's my job to decide which opinions I use and which ones I don't. But they have a right. They've earned a seat. And I like that open sense. Uh, it's it's just all based in respect and partnership, and and you know the belief that we have all earned our way here. So as someone who's got a lot of responsibility for hiring people into an organization, then it's the question of how do you how do you bring those right people in? And I'm not for sure I've figured out exactly how to do that, um, except to say that you know you know who the people are in your business that that really get the kind of place you are. You know who the big culture icons almost are. And you you know the people who can see through, you know, to the sort of the heart of, of someone you're meeting and 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 ask those kinds of questions. I think I'm probably the kind of person who interviews more on what I think about your the kind of human you're gonna be. Uh, and I let some of my other partners go much more on the technicality stuff because for me, I think, you know, it's about a little bit about playing in position in that way. You're not always going to get it right, but it is, I think, just again, you know, bringing the right mix of people to meet anyone you're bringing into the organization and getting the right opinions. You have to focus on an employee's maturity and work ethic versus age in order to manage generational expectations because these attributes are truly age agnostic. To create that compelling culture, you want to find similarities and synergies among your people. As a leader, or call yourself a coach, You have to chart the course, help people be open-minded, and foster that culture that is not about years of experience, but rather performance and aptitude. They've earned their position. And help people play in position, because everyone has a valuable role to play as a team. In the last part of our podcast, Beth continues to share her perspective on how to foster that team-centered culture, as well as hiring for aptitude versus capability. So let's talk about this notion of being self-centered versus team-centered. We see this a lot in, in not just in the agency business, but you know, in all industries where you have managers or even peers that tend to be focused on their own self-success versus the team success or finding the potential of other people in their organization who could rise everybody together. Talk about that challenge, you know, in in your business and then what you feel it takes to kind of break through that that inertia and that that um, bad behavior, so to speak. Well, you know, I think um, I think understanding what the root of that behavior is is really an important starting point because that behavior varies. You know, if you're at a junior level or a senior level, I think these days, especially in an industry like mine, where you know, I think you get a real sense of your age and a concern that somehow you might age out. When you're seeing it at a senior level, there's a bit of a, a 
you know, it's a bit terrifying, the idea that you could stop being as valuable as you once were. And that, in fact, just virtue of your age somehow makes you less relevant. But what's interesting to me is, you know, because there's a different tactic you're going to take um, with someone who's senior than someone with, who's junior. Because with a junior person who really just wants to be, you know, that self-centered, I did it, I, I, I. It's really about demonstrating for them just how scary a world it is when it's just you. Because when something goes wrong, it's just you. Uh, and there's no we in that. Whereas if you can give them the example of... And I do this with, with my team when I talk about building revenue. I might give you a revenue target, but I don't expect you to buy yourself. Go figure out how you're going to get that and do it. I expect you to find the opportunity. Come back. And with me, let's create a plan of who we need to put against this to help you convert that. And it's on all of us. Um, it's that sense that we've got your back because there's a team and you're a part of that team. And I think um, when it's illustrated specifically enough um, from a junior side, it's pretty easy to give them the the benefit of understanding why it's better to be part of that team. From a a senior side, it's it's a bit more difficult because that's a learned behavior from a long time ago. um, And it's not something you can necessarily change. But it may be something that sometimes I think it's sort of of self-resolved because culturally... There's such a schism between someone like that in an organization that's really teams, you know, team centered. Um, but the other side of it is also goes back to that sense of playing in position. You may have people who are very, very good at what they do and who aren't bad humans, but are just not good managers. And sometimes you then have to just take that part of their job and 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 maybe move that elsewhere. Because I don't want to ever take away from someone's talent. And as long as they are, you know, contributing as a good person, if they're not as skilled a manager as you would like, even if they're at a very senior level, then you do what you can to build the right support around them to provide them that support to those that might report into them or change the structure. Because, you know, not everybody's going to be great at it. Not everybody has to do it. If you can find alternative ways to structure your team, at the end of the day, it's really just about making sure that the people who work for you are getting the benefit of the strongest uh, support system, um, both in a way that drives them, but also, you know, lifts them up. And, uh, you know, it just means you might have to have a slightly different solution than you'd expect. Let's talk about hiring for aptitude. You had mentioned earlier, you really take a sort of human-centered approach versus some of your colleagues. So, you know, what is your thought around hiring more for aptitude versus, let's say, technical capability or having really the, the perfect resume on paper? Well... I have a bit of bias about this because if you know the, if I hadn't been given the chance to to move from media into client service at the level I was at, uh, as opposed to having to start over um, with the faith of my you know my my prospective employers that if you're smart and you know are good at client service, you'll probably be able to pick up the other stuff. I wouldn't be where I am today. So I, I do fundamentally believe that. If you simply look at a resume and you look at try to take off all the key things, I mean, look, we're not doctors, right? Or engineers. You don't need to know how to program certain systems to do most of what we do. So, I think in our, you know, um, in our business, we have a bit of the luxury to have uh, a bit more flexibility in trying to appreciate what someone can bring to the table that might not be as traditional or, or as they would say here, bog standard um, <laughs> in terms of, of, of what you would expect. But I do really believe that if, if you're smart and you've got enough humility to, to have to admit, especially at a senior level that you don't know what you don't know, you know and, and you work hard, you can probably learn almost anything. And, and so we should be open to that. It doesn't work all the time, but but I do think that you can really... I think resumes are so limiting. You know, you have to get someone in. You have to have a conversation with them over the table. Because the truth is, too, someone might have the perfect resume and you meet them and you just realize it's not going to be right. So I think you always have to be a bit open on both sides. But you know, I'm always going to be biased towards you know, being open to different aptitudes because it was fundamental in this latter part of my career and having any success. And what recommendations do you have for leaders like you looking to sustain this momentum around building a really people-centered organization? Or we can call it human-centered organization since you've used that word so many times. 
I know I probably overuse it, but I suppose you can't really overuse it. I think it, you know, I think it totally depends on the organization. It depends on the leadership. If the leadership is not bought into it, then it's not going to matter what gets written down or what mission statement is there. So it has to come from the people that are going to be responsible for enforcing it. It has to be true and authentic, you know, because I've worked many places where we talked about being a family, et cetera, but it, it's, it's a lot of words, but it, in action, it has to, to, to live across even the small moments as well as the big ones. And finally, what's the best way listeners can connect with you? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, they can see my website, which is probably pretty out of date now at bethfriedman.com. And they can certainly find me on, via Gyro UK's website. Right. So be true, be authentic, be human with your employees to build momentum for your business. Thanks for your great insight, Beth, today. Thanks for having me, Connie. I love what Beth said in our conversation. No matter how good you are, no client pays for just you. It's that wonderful mix of people, their personalities, backgrounds, and skill sets that really come together to make that magic. It's also these people you have to invest in, tap into their potential, groom them. Because if they're smart and also have the humility to admit what they know and don't know, they can learn just about anything. Create that team-centered environment by providing a strong support system for both motivation and morale. And it's important to not forget that a business needs to be as human as it can possibly be. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to the people. It has to be authentic and hold true in the small moments as well as the big ones. Thanks for listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast. You can connect with Beth via LinkedIn, find her on Gyro UK's website, or check out her personal website at bethfriedman.com. That's B-E-T-H-F-R-E-E-D-M-A-N.com. If you'd liked what you heard, please subscribe to the show on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also find us in the Google Play Store and Stitcher Radio. And if you want to hear previous episodes or even get show notes from this episode, you can also visit us on our podcast page at flywheelassociates.com slash podcast. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.